Shalom, Shalom family. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to Trumpet's Call. I'm Maria. I pray that you are holding on to faith, Amuna, and holding on to hope during these times. Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom to each of you. Thank you for joining me once again on the channel. I'm so happy that you're here for another Shabbat message. And I had been away taking a little bit of a break. So here I am, I'm back. And um, I'd like to say that I got lots of rest, but not so much. I, I worked just about the whole time, but I have no complaints because now is the time for work. It's daytime. Night cometh when no man can work. So we must be about our father's business while it is day. So I just want to welcome you back to another session, another lesson. And we're going to be talking about today the keys of power. Keys to power. Honor, humility, and submission. Now, why is this important? It's important because we as Yasharal, we are rising and we are once again being directed back to our rightful place of high status before the Most High and in His kingdom. And what that brings is power, status, influence. It brings with it a position. And so in order to fully walk in that, rest in that, and stand in that, we need to make sure that we are walking in honor, humility, and submission in regard to how we treat those who are in authority over us and how we receive those things as the one who is in authority and also being the one in authority, how we give those things to those who have authority over us. So we need to really learn these things once again, because we have been held in the land of Babylon, in the land of Egypt. And many of you have grown up in the United States of America, this republic, they call it, the land of democracy, where people supposedly get a vote and you get to determine who your elected officials are going to be and you get a say in the laws that are made and the governance that is had in this country. But we recognize that that is just a smoke screen. It's not really happening that way, but that's how they tell us it operates. But that's not the way that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of the Shamayim works. We don't necessarily get a vote. The closest thing we have to a vote is petitioning the king on our knees entering into his courts with praise upon our lips and our desire in our heart and just pray that he would have mercy upon us and grant us what we are requesting from him. So being a part of an absolute monarchy, we must operate in a different way. And so before we go home, we need to learn how to honor the king, how to honor those who are placed in authority over us, how to submit to authority and how to be humble humble, humble, humble. It is a key characteristic. Even the father who is all powerful is humble. He is so humble and so wonderful. So we're going to get started for today. We're going to begin our studies by defining the word honor. We're looking at the free dictionary and the word honor is defined as high respect as that shown for special merit, recognition, or esteem. It also means great privilege, good name, reputation, a source or cause of credit. It also means a mark, token, or gesture of respect or distinction, such as a military decoration. So to summarize the word honor so far, it's just a sign of respect. It really, that is the key word respect, being respected. And for a man and for the heavenly father, it's really important to be respected. Let's continue on. We also see that it means high rank or a position of honor, like kingship. It means the honor used with his or her or your as a title or a form of address for certain officials, such as judges, mayors. It also means a sense of principled uprightness of character personal integrity, a code of integrity, dignity, and pride, chiefly among men that was maintained in some societies as in feudal Europe by force of arms. So the father, we know, has a code of integrity, dignity, and pride 
He has his Torah that he has given to us to indicate his character. And so when we keep his Torah, we honor him. We show honor and deference to him and respect to him by keeping the commandments that he has given to us. He is our king. He is the king of the Shamaim, the king of heaven. And as we honor him and honor his commands, he is respected and honored. In Romans chapter 13, we read, For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are Yahuwah's ministers. Now, the Apostle Shaul here is talking about those who are in authority over us, whether they be foreign governments or the nation of Yasharal. He's talking about all forms of government, all forms of leadership and power over us ultimately point back to the Father because all power is of Yahuwah. And if someone has power over us, it's because the Most High gave them that power. And when we honor the person who's been given power over us, we honor the Father. For this cause, pay ye tribute also, for they are Yahuwah's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So summarizing, no matter what position or station you find someone in, whatever it is that due that person, based on their status and their position, we are to give that person their due, so to speak. So if you have a king and it is customary to bow before a king, then you bow before the king in honor of the position that the king has. Okay, And if it's customary to pay taxes or tribute to a particular government, that's something that we're to do as well as a sign of honor and respect, recognizing that the person, this company, this country has power over you because the Most High has given them power. Continuing, we're going to be reading a few verses of scripture in the book of Numbers. And the key here as we read is we're looking to see how the people, how the nation of Yasharal treats its leaders we'll be able to pick up on some things here that will help us to learn what not to do when we're gathered. And it's important for us right now to study what happened during the gathering in the book of Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, because we want to be able to learn from our ancestors' mistakes. We want to be able to see the things that they didn't get quite right so that we can not repeat their mistakes as we are anticipating our gathering coming up soon. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusten, and the children of Yasharal also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, and by now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all besides this manna before our eyes. Then Masha, Moses, heard the people weep throughout their families, and every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of Yahuwah was kindled greatly. Masha, Moses, also was displeased. And Masha said unto Yahuwah, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou layest the burden of all these people upon me? Have I conceived all these people? Have I begotten them, that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom, as a nursing father beareth the sucking child, unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? So Moshe right now is feeling dishonored. He's feeling dishonored. When we complain and whine and moan against the authority that's been placed over us, when we whine and complain, about something that we're not receiving at the hand of someone whom the Most High has placed in charge of us, ultimately, the complaint is against the Most High. And we're questioning his goodness and his greatness. And to do so is to dishonor him. It's not a very honoring act. And so may we not dishonor the Most High by questioning his goodness and his ability to provide for his people as a father. He is a father. What man out there wants their family complaining and saying, oh, we don't have any food to eat. I remember when we were in slavery, we had all the food we could eat. And now that you have come and set us free, here we are going to starve. What man wants to be disrespected in that way? I can't think of one. Certainly Heavenly Father doesn't want to be dishonored and disrespected. 
And Masha doesn't want to be disrespected either because he has been given authority over these people and they question his every move. It's dishonoring. To the nth degree, it's dishonoring. So let's define the word dishonor. Back to the free dictionary again. It means loss of honor. Simply put, respect or reputation. So when you lose a sense of honor, respect, or reputation, you have been dishonored. The condition of having lost honor or a good repute. A cause of loss of honor. Failure to pay or refusal to accept a note, bill, or another commercial obligation. To bring shame or disgrace upon. To treat in a disrespectful or demeaning manner. To fail or refuse to accept or pay a bill, a note, or a check, for example. So the key to dishonor is a loss of respect, losing face, so to speak. So to walk up to somebody who has great position and great authority and question it, question their authority, question their power, question their wisdom, question that maybe you don't know what you're doing. Maybe, just perhaps, the person that you chose and put in charge of us Maybe he doesn't know what he's doing. And if he doesn't know what he's doing and you chose him, maybe you don't know what you're doing either. It is the height of disrespect. And that is what our ancestors were doing to the father and to Masha as they continued to question everything that they did and complain, complain, complain. Complaining is dishonoring. We shouldn't do it. We should try not to do it as, as much as we can. And when we find ourselves in the process of doing it, we need to immediately pivot and start giving praise. The minute you find yourself complaining about something, stop yourself and begin to praise. Just reverse what you just did. So now we're going to talk about leadership because in the process of honoring, we must recognize the leadership or the authority that the person whom you're honoring has over you. So if you're honoring someone, nine times out of 10, this person is going to have some sort of power and authority over you. It's going to be some sort of leader, someone with status and position. But before we do that, I want to briefly talk about Moses's name. Now, I have been using the name Moses or Moshe or Musa. I've used plenty of names for Moses. And I'm in the process of continually learning and learning and learning this Paleo Hebrew. So I'm still a work in progress. So please be patient with me as I continue to learn. So I wanted to study out Moses' name because I wanted to make sure I was calling him what was accurate based on the Paleo Hebrew. Okay, so we know based on wikipedia.com that Moses' given name in English, as we render it, is Moses. But according to the Torah, the name Moses comes from a Hebrew verb. So Moses' name essentially is a verb, and it means to pull out or to draw out, meaning of water, to draw out of the water. As we know, Moses was drawn out of the water, the river Nile, by Pharaoh's daughter, saving his life. So she named him to draw out. So it goes on to read, and the infant Moses was given this name by Pharaoh's daughter after she rescued him from the Nile. And we read that in Exodus chapter 2, verse 10. So the word Moses means to draw out. So I thought, well, let's see what that word is. And in the Hebrew, the word to draw out is Masha. It's Masha. It's the same Hebrew letters as the word Moses or Moshe in Hebrew, but it's pronounced a little differently. So I had been pronouncing it Moshe, but properly rendered, it's more likely Masha in the Paleo Hebrew. So you will hear me calling him Masha from now on because Masha means to draw as if to draw out of water. Okay. So I just wanted to explain that really briefly. Continuing on. Whence should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me saying, give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone. Moses continues to bear his heartfelt complaint before the Most High. He's saying, it's just too much for me. It's just too much. They're complaining too much. I cannot bear up under all this pressure. He goes on to say, because it is too heavy for me, too heavy a burden. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. For if I have found favor in thy sight, let me not see my wretchedness. And Yahuwah said unto Masha, gather unto me 
70 men, elders of Yasharal. So the Most High is going to give him some help. He says, I know, I understand, it is a burden. My people are a handful. And sometimes when they get the stiff neck and the hard heart, they can really be a handful. So I'm going to give you some help. I'm going to establish a hierarchy of authority, having the direct authority be from the Father, Yahuwah and the Shamayim, and he's giving authority to Masha on the earth. And then from Masha, he will distribute this power and this authority and this anointing to 70 elders of Yashara. Continuing, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people and officers over them and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there. And I will take of the spirit, the Ruach, which is upon thee and will put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. And you find that in Numbers Bimidbar chapter 11. So what we're seeing here is the establishment of judges slash elders and leaders that have been given authority to lead alongside Masha. Because the burden is too much for him to bear alone, he's being given help. So there's an authority structure a judgment structure, judges being established, elders being established. And I'm going to say, brothers and sisters, this is what the Father, I believe, is doing right now at this time. We are at the cusp of our gathering out of here. And the Father, in the realm of the Ruach, and even in the realm of sight, is choosing for himself leaders. He's allowing this Masha anointing to fall on certain people that he's chosen in this hour to help administrate and to lead and to govern and to teach and to instruct and to rebuke and to exhort. We see it happening all around us as the Most High is raising up his people in this last hour, both male and female. This anointing is falling upon these people whom the Most High has chosen. He is preparing us for the trip home, and he's establishing his leadership already. And that is why it is so important that we respect, honor, and submit to the authority that the Father is bringing forth now. Because if we can't submit here, we certainly won't be able to submit once we get back into the land. So this is a test for us to see how well we handle the leaders that the Most High is raising up in this hour. Are we going to be critical of them as Miriam and Aaron was with Masha? Are we going to question their loyalties? Are we going to question who they're married to? Are we going to accept if the Father has given this person authority, if the Father's raising this person up, he knows what he's doing. Continuing on, we're reading in Revelation chapter 5, and has made us unto Alua, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. This is an indication of our future standing before the Most High. On this earth, kings and priests. Now, let us be aware that not every single Hebrew is going to be a king or a priest. If every single Hebrew is a king or a priest, who's going to be in the congregation of the righteous? So the Most High, based on my understanding of Scripture, is choosing the faithful to elevate and place in positions of leadership and authority within the kingdom. And he's watching and seeing and determining who he will raise up right now. In Revelation chapter 1, we read, And he has made us to be a kingdom of priests to his Alua and Father, and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So once again, we see this reference to a kingdom of priests. We will have priests and kings within the nation of Yasharal. And then there will be strangers and foreigners and Gentiles who will be brought into the kingdom to live and to serve within the kingdom, to serve the, the Father and to serve those whom the Most High is giving authority to. And also we read in Isaiah, Yasha Yahu, chapter 61. But you will be called the priests of Yahuwah. You will be spoken of as ministers of our Alua. You will eat the wealth of nations, and in their riches will you boast. Yes, so that is what is coming for us as Yasharal is rising. Yasharal is rising, and so our future is to eat the wealth of the nations and to be Baruch, Baruch like we've never experienced before. And so even if not all people within the nation of Yasharal are kings and or priests, they're all going to be benefited. They're all going to be Baruch. They're all going to be used of the Most High in some way to benefit his kingdom. 
And so we are a nation of kings and priests. And in the nation, the Most High will raise up whom he chooses, when he chooses, to be given positions of authority. And as that's happening, we've got to learn how to respect that authority, lest we fall into trouble like our ancestors did in the wilderness. Continuing. And when the people complained, it displeased Yahuwah, and Yahuwah heard it. And his anger was kindled, and the fire of Yahuwah burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. I'm going to pause right here. Because the people were complaining against Moses, Masha. They were complaining about not having something that they felt that they needed. They were complaining. And when they complained, Yahuwah heard it. When we complain, brothers and sisters, Yahuwah hears us. When we complain about someone that's put an authority over you, when you complain about your husband or complain about your wife or your boss or your president or whomever, Yahuwah hears you. He hears you. And he does not like complaining. He does not like murmuring or backbiting. He just does not like that. He wants us to be thankful for all things. And he wants us to be able to see his hand in all situations, even though they may be unpleasant, even though they may really hurt us or disappoint us. He wants us to be able to see his hand in it and give praises to him, even though we may not understand. Continuing. And the people cried unto Masha, and when Masha prayed unto Yahuwah, the fire was quenched. And so you see Masha right here being an intercessor. You see him standing in the gap for the same people who were complaining about him. Look at that. Look at that. The people are complaining about him and they cry out when they're judged to him and he intercedes on their behalf. That's love. That is love. And he called the name of the place Tabera because the fire of the Yahuwah burnt among them. And so what you see in this example is an example once again of dishonor. The people, the congregation, they're dishonoring Masha and they're dishonoring Yahuwah. Because when you dishonor the person who's in authority, you're dishonoring the person who has given that person authority. And Miriam and Aharon spake against Masha because of the Ethiopian Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. Now I want to speak briefly about this word Ethiopian. The word Ethiopian is not in the scriptures. If you look for it in the Hebrew, you won't find it. When you look for this word in the Hebrew, you're going to find Cushite. That is the word that's supposed to be in the scriptures. The word Ethiopian is a European invention. The people in Africa, they were not called Ethiopians. They were called Cushites, okay? Meaning they're descendants of Cush. So Masha had married an Ethiopian or a Cushite woman and Aharon and Miriam had a problem with that. They had a problem. They had a problem with whom he had married and they wanted him to know about it. They were being very critical of him and they were telling him, I guess because they figured, well, I'm your sister and I'm your brother, so I get to tell you what I think about you. They're not seeing him in the role of authority over them because the father had given Masha authority over the entire nation of Yasharal. They're not seeing him in that role. They're seeing him as, you're my brother, you're doing something that I don't like, and I get to tell you what I think about you. I'm going to roll my neck, and I'm going to put my finger out in your face, and I'm going to tell you, I don't like who you married. You're going to have to answer to me. Well, those who have been given authority don't answer to the people. They answer to the Father. They answer to the one who has placed them in authority, the Father. So Moshe's answer was to the Father, not to Miriam or Aharun. That is not who he was to answer to. So they're unhappy that he married a Cushite woman. So let's speak about this before we move on. This Cushite woman that Masha married, people look at this and they say, well, it had to have been Zipporah. Zipporah is the woman that he married. So she had to have been the Cushite woman that they weren't approving of. Well, when you read the scripture, we'll see very clearly that Zipporah was a Midianite and she was a descendant of Abraham. One of the children that Abraham, Abraham had with Keturah, his wife after Sarah died, was named Midian. And so the descendants of Midian are the Midianites. And so the woman that Masha married was a Midianite. Her father, Ruel, was a Midianite. So Midianites are not Cushites. Cushites are the descendants of Ham. 
and Midianites are the descendants of Shem. They're Shemites. I believe what Aharon and Miriam were talking about is when Masha was married to a woman, a Cushite woman. So this is not in the scriptures. It's in the book of Jasher. You find in the book of Jasher that Masha, when he left Pharaoh, he was a young man. He went and he lived among the Cushites and he lived with them for a while. And then the king died. And when the king died, they saw the wisdom in Masha and they made him king over the Cushites. And he reigned over the Cushites for 40 years. And when he reigned over them, they said, well, since you were the king, we're now going to give you the king's wife. And so he took this wife, this woman, to be his wife. He didn't choose her, but she became his wife. And as a result, now he's married to a Cushite woman. And I believe this might be what they're referring to. But if you read the book of Jasher, you'll see that Masha may have been married to this woman, but he never touched her. 40 years, he never touched her. He never consummated the marriage. So how much of a marriage really was it? But he never did. He honored the father so much. And he said, we are instructed not to take wives from among the Cushite women, uh, among foreign women. And so he never touched her. So remember, Masha is a Levite. And the Levites have specific instructions of the Most High to only marry daughters of Zion. They are instructed. They are not to take wives from amongst the nations. Now you'll see examples of other men, Hebrew men in the scriptures who marry Canaanites and other ites around the region. And some of those marriages the Most High approves of, at least he doesn't disprove of it in the scriptures. We don't read about that. But with regard to the Levites, the priests, they are only allowed to marry women who are daughters of Zion. Here it is now, many, many, many years after this has happened, and you have Miriam and Aharon bringing this up to Masha as if it's a problem. But the father has approved of Masha. You know that he has approved of him because of the works. That is a sign. The sign of the father's approval is that he doesn't bring us under judgment and destroy us and that his presence is with us continually. And when we ask him for things, he answers. That's a sign of intimacy. That's a sign of relationship. So Miriam and Aharon should, should have known that Masha had a relationship with the Most High and of that. If he was doing anything that was displeasing to the father, the father would have told him. So they're upset because of this Cushite woman and we're going to continue to hear what they have to say. And they said, Hath Yahuwah indeed spoken only by Masha? Oh, here we go. I think this is the heart of the matter right here. And he goes on to say, they go on to say, Hath he not spoken also by us? Oh, yeah. And here's the next line. And Yahuwah heard it. Remember, brothers and sisters, he hears it all. When we complain against the authority, he hears us. And he does not like it because to question them is to question him. He doesn't like it. So he's like listening and then he's going to act. And we're going to see how he responds to this accusation and this attack against his anointed Masha. So let's talk a little bit more about what they're saying here. What Miriam and Aharun are saying, are you the only one who's anointed Masha? Are you the only one who hears from the Most High? We hear from the Most High. What gives you the right to take authority over us? We hear, we hear from him. Don't you know about the priesthood of all believers? I'm, I'm a priest. You're a priest. We're all priests. We all hear from the most high equally. You have no right to have any authority over us. But he did because the most high gave him the authority. And so if they had a problem with Masha, they had to take it up with the father not with Masha, because the father is going to defend the person that he has given authority to. He's going to defend them, and he does, okay? So they're telling him, and they're calling into question his life. They're saying, you married a Cushite woman. Does Yahuwah only speak to you? So they're, they're judging him. They're judging him. They're judging whom he married. They're judging his actions, and they're saying, we think that we should have authority because we hear the Most High too. It's not just you. And the scripture goes on to say in verse three, now the man Masha was very meek. Another word for meek is humble. 
above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. That's quite a statement. The scripture is saying that essentially Masha was the most humble man on the face of the earth. And Yahuwah spake suddenly unto Masha and unto Aharon and unto Miriam. And this is what he said. Come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. This reminds me of getting called to the principal's office. Ooh, you in trouble. You getting called to the principal's office, you in trouble. The Most High is calling these three out unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out. And Yahuwah came down in a pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aharon and Miriam. And they both came forward. Oh, I would be shaken in my boots at this point. And he said, Hear now my words. Oh, I'm scared. I'm scared for them. I'm scared for myself. The Most High saying, hear me now and hear me well. Hear now my words. And then he says, if there be a prophet among you, I, Yahuwah, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Masha is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. He has given him authority in his whole house, the whole nation of Yasharal. And he's saying he's faithful. This is the most high's way of saying, I find no fault with him. How dare you find fault with him? He's my servant that I've placed in charge of my whole house. I find no flaw in him. How dare you find flaw? This is a dangerous thing to stand before the living Alua and be at fault. And in this moment, what we're seeing is them rebelling against the authority that the Most High has established. Plain and simple, they're in rebellion. Then they're in sin. And it's a dangerous place to be. It really is. Before we move on, I'm going to define very quickly this word humble. Because we see that the Most High describes um, Masha as being meek, very meek, which is humble. So it's defined as marked by meekness and modesty in behavior, attitude or spirit, not arrogant or prideful, showing deferential or submissive respect, low in rank, quality or station, unpretentious, lowly, to cause to feel humble, to cause to have a lower condition or status, to abase. We can see that it's This word is from the Middle English or French Old English from the Latin humilis, which means low or lowly, and also from the word humus or humus, which means ground. It's as if to lay yourself flat on the ground because you are making yourself lower than everything around you. That is what Masha was like. He was humble. He was unassuming. He did not boast He wasn't prideful. He wasn't arrogant. He didn't say, I've got the authority. You've got to listen to me. He didn't do that. And yet they still criticized him. But the father is his defense. Yahuwah is his defense. And when we place our trust in the Most High, he will be our defense. He will defend us. Continuing. So we find that the Most High has made a statement about Masha. So we're continuing on to see what action the Most High takes against Miriam and Aharon. Verse 8. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently not in dark speeches, and the similitude of Yahuwah shall he behold. Okay, so this is, this is profound. What the Most High is saying, if there's a prophet among you, I will speak to him in visions and in dreams, but not so with Masha. I don't speak to him in visions and dreams. I speak to him face to face. Face to face. This is superior to dreams and visions. There are, the, there are prophets who are called, who are communicating with the Father via visions and dreams. But Masha, face to face. He says, I speak to him mouth to mouth. And even apparently, not in dark speeches, not in things that have to be interpreted, but I speak to him plainly, and the similitude of Yahuwah shall he behold. He shall behold this the likeness, my likeness. Now, who is the likeness in the image of Yahuwah? It's Yahusha. Yahusha is the likeness in the image of Yahuwah. So he beholds him. He beholds the messenger 
of the Most High, face to face, mouth to mouth. And then he goes on to say, and this is frightening and terrifying. He goes on to say, Wherefore, then, were ye not afraid to speak against my servant, Masha? Oh, Father. He's asking them, weren't you scared? Weren't you afraid to speak against the person that I have chosen, my servant? Weren't you afraid to put your mouth on him? Didn't you fear? Didn't you know that if you place your mouth or your hands on the Most High's anointed, I'm going to defend him and judge you? Didn't you know that? Didn't you know that? Weren't you afraid? Weren't you afraid to speak against him in the way you have? And the anger of Yahuwah was kindled against them, and he departed. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aharun looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. Now we know that leprosy is a form of judgment that the Most High brings upon nations and peoples at his will. And to me, when I look at it, it seems to be an indication of the removal of the presence and or the favor of the Most High. That's what it seems to me. Immediately, Miriam is leprous, white as snow. Continuing. And Aharun said unto Masha, Alas, my Adon, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead, of whom the flesh is half consumed when he cometh out of his mother's womb. And Masha cried unto Yahuwah, saying, Heal her now, O Alua, I beseech thee. This is so powerful. This is so powerful. Immediately here, as we see Miriam being judged, Aharun becomes an intercessor for Miriam. And who does he intercede to? Not to the father, but to Masha. He says, my Adon, my Lord, my Adon, I beg you, don't lay this sin upon us. We have been foolish to speak against you. We have been foolish. We have sinned. Let her not be as one dead of whom the flesh is half consumed when he comes out of his mother's womb. He's talking about here when a child, a Hebrew child is born, for the most part, they're born really lighter skinned. And as they get older, they get darker and darker and darker. So you might have a child be born and be fairly light skinned. And then as they get older, they just get darker. They get like two, three, four shades darker as they get older. So he's saying, essentially, Miriam kind of looks like she did when she came out of the womb. She's get, she's pretty light skinned right now. She's light skinned. She, she's white and so she's going to be one like dead because how can you really survive in that hot sun on the continent having this white, white, white skin like this? Not every day, not day in and day out. And especially when you're not used to it, you don't know how to protect it from the sun. They did not have sunscreen back then. So here she is, leprous. And you know, because she's got leprosy, she's going to be kicked out of the camp. She's not going to be able to stay with the rest of the Hebrews. So Masha cries out for his sister and he intercedes for her to his friend and his authority, Yahuwah. He says, I beg you, heal her now. Heal her now. And in this instance, you see Masha, leader, also being intercessor. He is interceding on behalf of Miriam, even though she sinned against him. Even though she talked about him, even though she treated him like he was sitting against the Most High, here he is interceding for her. And this is how the father responds. And we read, And Yahuwah said unto Masha, If her father had but spit in her face, she should not be ashamed seven days. Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that, let her be received in again. Wow, this sounds just like something my mom would say. You know, we grew up Gullah. This sounds just like something my mom would have said or one of the, our aunties or great aunts or grandmas or something would say, if you had but spit in her face, if your father had but spit in her face, if you had just disciplined her, if you had just disciplined her, she wouldn't be such that she would be flying off the handle and getting into things that she shouldn't be involved in. 
But the father had mercy upon her. And he said, you're going to be out of the camp seven days. She was outside the camp. She couldn't come in. And after that period of time, she was allowed to come back in again. So this is what happened to her as a result of putting her mouth and her judgment upon the Most High's anointed, upon his chosen. We must be very careful, brothers and sisters, during this time because there are people that he's choosing. He's raising them up and we may not like them. We may not like their lifestyle. We may not like the choices that they made. We may not understand. We may not like how they talk to people. Now, ultimately, we should all be loving to one another. But the Most High is the judge, not us. So if there's something about a leader that you don't particularly like, Take that thing to the Father if you must, and then allow the Father to school you or correct you or advise you or whatever. But trust and believe, if there's an authority that the Most High has called and they're in sin, the Most High will judge. He really will. He really, really will. And we can trust that. We can. So we've seen here examples of dishonor. So now we know what dishonor looks like. And if we know what dishonor looks like, we can figure out what honor looks like. Honor. Don't complain against the authority that the Most High has established over you. Don't accuse him of sin. Don't put your mouth or your hands on him. Honor the position. Even if you don't feel like you want to honor the person, honor the position, honor the authority because it's coming from the Father. And when you honor the position, you're honoring Yahuwah. Okay? We've also seen some rebellion here, which is the lack of submission to authority. Submit to the authority that's been placed over you. And if Aharun and Miriam had done so, they would not have ended up judged. Miriam ended up having leprosy, but Aharun, he lost his life eventually. Once he took off those high priestly robes, he died in the mountain. And he faced the judgment that was due to him at that time. So it's important that we operate according to kingdom principles, according to the rules of an absolute monarchy. We don't get a vote. The only vote we get is on our knees, where we beg and plead the king to petition the king to decide in our favor. So now we're going to read more about submission to authority. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die, and when he heard of Yahusha, he sent unto him the elders of the Yahudim, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Yahusha, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he would do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Then Yahusha went with them. And when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Adon, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. So this is pretty wonderful. What we see here, and it must be noted, I'm going to pay attention to this because this is important. You have this centurion. He's a Gentile, and he needs healing for his servant. Okay, And you have the disciples, the Talmudim, telling Yahusha, Yahusha, this man loves our nation. He built us a synagogue. Do you see that? He's been good to our nation so you can allow your favor to rest on him because he as a Gentile has baruched Yasharal. And he who baruchs Yasharal shall be favored by the Most High because those who pray for the peace of Jerusalem, both the city and the people of the city, they shall be favored of the Most High. So this man, he even got a second look from the Most High's son when he decided to show favor and goodness to the nation of Yashara by building them a synagogue. So let that be a note to you Gentiles to be good to the Most High's people. Okay? And he's saying, this man, the centurion, who was full of faith, he said, I'm not worthy, Yahushua, for you to come under my roof. All you have to do is say the word, and I know that my servant will be healed. Great faith. Continuing. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Yahushua heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, 
I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Yashara. And so the man had the answer to his prayer. He received the healing of his servant because of his great faith. But he was first brought to the attention of Yahusha because of the kind acts that he had committed upon the nation of Yasharal. So Gentiles, be good to Yasharal. The Most High loves those who love his people and who favor them. So be good to Yasharal. Be kind. Speak kind words. Do kind deeds. Okay? But we see here this idea of submitting to authority. The centurion had people under him. He knew what it was like to tell somebody to do something and expect them to do it. And he knew that if Yahushua but said the word, it would be done. It could not but be done. He knew that. And his faith was great. And Yahushua marveled at his great faith. And he was saying here that none of my people, none of the Hebrews here, none of the Yahudim have this kind of faith. They don't understand that all I need to do is speak the word and have it be so. They don't understand. But this Gentile, he understands, and he has received favor upon himself because of his faith and because of the kind acts that he has committed on behalf of Yasharal. I want to read one more verse of scripture, and then we're going to um, talk about one little topic, and then we're going to end for the day. We're going to find this in Isaiah chapter 49, Yasha Yahu. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, of Yaakov, and to restore the preserved of Yasharal, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, that thou mayest be my salvation until the ends of the earth. What we're seeing here is the Most High referring to Yahusha, his servant, whom he raised up to gather, to raise up, to restore the tribes of Yaakov, the nation of Yasharal, to reserve and preserve the heritage of Yasharal back to its rightful place. That was Yahusha's mission to bring salvation in every sense of the word, salvation in every area to the nation of Yasharal, but also to be a light unto the Gentiles, meaning those who had faith, like the centurion that we just read about, those who had faith could not only partake of healing, but could also partake of life in the kingdom, could be brought into the kingdom to serve the kingdom. This is what Yahushua's mission was, to restore Yasharal and to be a light unto the Gentiles. And because we are ambassadors of Yahusha, it is our mission as well. Brothers and sisters, it is our mission, part of our responsibility in the world of being kings and priests is we're supposed to be a light unto the Gentiles. That's what we're supposed to be. And it is very difficult to be a light unto a group of people that you hate, that you can't stand. It's very difficult. Now, this is a very challenging topic and the Most High was laying this on my heart to speak, and so I'll be brief. I'm not going to belabor the point. But the Most High was laying on my heart that He is hearing Gentiles cry out to Him because they don't feel like they have a place. This is what He's saying. He's hearing Gentiles cry out to Him because His people are not providing hospitality within the kingdom for them. And this is a problem. One of the things that we love about Father Abraham, and we read about this particularly in the apocryphal books, that Abraham was hospitable. If anybody had a need, he was there. He opened up his house. He gave when people needed. When Lot got himself captured in Sodom, he armored up. Abraham armored up, took 300 of his servants, and went and got Lot back. He was kind and generous and gentle and without fault, at least that I could see in the scriptures. He was hospitable. He showed hospitality to the stranger and to the poor. And we are called to be like our father Abraham in this regard, to show hospitality to the stranger and to those who are poor in faith, those who are poor in Torah, those who are poor because they don't have access to the oracles of Yahuwah. We have been given so much, and to whom much is given, much is required. Brothers and sisters, we hold the oracles of the Torah. We are the kings and the priests of the world. We are to be the lights of the world so that the Gentiles can see the light of Yahusha in us and be drawn to that light. But we, some of us, 
have been putting a bushel over our light when we see the Gentiles walk by. Because we're hurt, and I understand it. I feel it too. We're hurt and we're angry, and we don't like the way we've been treated in the past, and we don't like the way we're being treated right now. And we're angry about that. I understand. It makes perfect sense. I'm angry too. But the Father is saying to us, we can't forsake our call because we're hurt. His grace is sufficient to heal us of everything that's ever hurt us. But we can't forsake our call. Part of our call is to be a light so that those who are in darkness can see our light and be drawn to it. But if we hold unforgiveness and bitterness in our hearts, our light becomes darkness. And if the light that we think is light is really darkness, how great is that darkness? May we not be deceived into thinking that our Hebrewness will save us. It will not. It gives us oracles. It gives us access. But we all must approach by faith and obedience, all of us. So the Father is saying he has been hearing the prayers and the cries of the Gentiles who are crying out to him saying, we don't have a place. We don't know where to go. They don't want us. They don't want us. And he's not pleased. Brothers and sisters, he's not pleased because he is hospitable. And he has thrown open the kingdom wide for whosoever will come. If they want to come and serve the king, they can come and serve the king. We should be giving them a carte blanche invitation to say, come, come into the kingdom and serve the king. Yes, come on. The father requires this of you. He requires that of you. You're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. But when we don't do that, we're forsaking our call. Ultimately, right now, our priority is to awaken the masses. Ultimately, we know that. And I don't question that one bit. But in the process of awakening the masses, in the process of preaching and teaching to those who need to hear the Basora so that they can awaken to their true identity and return to the Most High, when we run across a Gentile here or there, let us not forsake the word from them. Let us not withhold the word. Let us not withhold any semblance of kindness. I mean, those who are repentant, And those who want to be a part of us, those who want to serve, those who want to be good to us, like the centurion who was good to the nation of Yasharal, let us not withhold our kindness when it's in our power to give it. The Father is watching. So may we understand our mission and our call. May we understand that we're being called and given a high calling in the Father, a high calling. We're going to be many of us priests, judges, kings, we're going to be in charge of things on the earth, but we've got to love people. We've got to love the people that we're going to be serving. And I know it's hard, brothers and sisters, please don't think I'm being critical because I'm not. I understand. I feel it too sometimes. I do. I really do. That we've got to find a way to move past the hurt and the bitterness so that we don't forsake our call of being the lights of the world. They're watching us. They want to know that they have access to the kingdom. And we are the ones who are the administrators of the kingdom. We're the ones who can say, come on in, or nope, we don't want you. And they feel that. The Gentiles are feeling that. And the Father is hearing it because they're crying out to him. So may we all have a mindset of what our role and our mission is in this world, to be righteous, to be set apart, to be kings and priests and judges and to do the things that are pleasing in the most high sight, but also to be a light to the world and to be an ambassador of Yahushua Hamashiach, to throw the door open wide for those who want to come into the kingdom and serve, we should not bar the way. So may we all repent before the most high for all that we've done that may have discouraged someone away from the kingdom. And I repent for anything I may have done in my teachings or anything I may have said that may have discouraged anyone from wanting to draw near to the Most High. That is not what we desire to do. We desire for those to draw near. We want as many as who want to come and be a part of the kingdom and serve the Most High to come. If they're willing to adopt the the Torah and to obey and to have faith in Yahusha and to serve his people, who are we to tell them that they can't come? That's, that's beyond our power. We, we can't do that. So I repent first 
And for those of you who may be struggling with hatred and, and animus and bitterness, I understand. The Father understands too, I believe. But His grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in weakness. He knows our pain. He knows. He's the one who afflicted us. Can we be real for a second, brothers and sisters? I want to give you an example of something. The Father gave me this example, and I want to give it to you. The Father brought to himself a people. He chose us, and we were highly favored. We were so baruched, and we had a wonderful relationship with the Most High, but we kept turning to the Elohim, the God of the nations, and wanting to worship them. And we kept turning from our King. We kept turning away. And finally, he said, okay. Go ahead and turn if that's what you want to do. He divorced the northern kingdom, but he held on to the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom found themselves in captivity in Babylon. He brought them back home after 70 years. And then they found themselves under Greek occupation, under Roman occupation. And then Yahusha came and he said, now was the day of the free favors of the Most High. I've come to bring you salvation. And they said, we have no God but Caesar. Once again, the people rejected the salvation that had been sent to them. So Yahushua said, your house is left unto you desolate. You will see me no more until you say, Baruch Haba Bashem Yahuwah. Baruch, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahuwah. That's what we were supposed to say the first time, but we didn't do it. So we must say it again, and we must mean it this time, and he will return. But here's the thing. When he declared desolations on our nations and the Romans came and we zealots, the zealots thought that they were going to fight and have victory over the Romans. They did not, obviously. And our city was desolate and burned and the temple was desecrated and destroyed. And we were taken into slavery and strewn and scattered and had a level of success for a period of time until finally in the 1300s and the 1400s, the, the persecution began again in earnest. And we, from the coast of Africa, were taken into slavery as slaves. And now we are scattered throughout the four corners of the earth in different places of the world, speaking different languages all over the world, the scattered children of the house of Yasharal and of Judah. All of us, we're all over the place. The Most High, used the nations to spank us, brothers and sisters. He did. He used the Gentile nations as a belt, as a rod, to spank us, to give us a divine smackdown, and to humble us, to prepare us, and make us worthy of what we had been given. To make us understand the huge responsibility that we have as kings and priests of the earth to make us understand just how important it is, this role that we have. And after now, we're coming to our awareness and we're saying, oh my goodness, that's what happened to us. We were being punished for our sins. Oh, you mean I'm a Hebrew? Oh, I'm just now coming to this understanding. That's why that happened to us. And you know what's happening to some of us, brothers and sisters? We're getting angry. We're getting angry that we were judged. We're getting angry that our nation was declared desolate. We're getting angry that we were taken into slavery. We're getting angry that we were mistreated. We're getting angry. We're angry about that. I understand. I understand. We experienced unspeakable horror and we're angry about it. But here's what's happening. We're getting angry at the belt and not the one who was wielding the belt. The father did it, brothers and sisters. It was the father wielding the belt. The father used the Gentiles to to crush us. It was the father's doing. And it was marvelous in his eyes. He did it. He crushed us. He bruised us. He whipped us. He beat us. He sold us into slavery. He did it. So if we're going to be angry, we've got to be angry at him. Because he did it. He used the Gentiles. They were his belt, his rod. Now granted, they did take advantage. And they did more than the father intended. At least that's what I see in the scriptures. But the father's going to recompense for that. He's going to take care of that. Bottom line is, it was the father's hand that was wielding the belt, that was wielding the rod. And now we're mad at the rod and we're mad at the stick and we're mad at the belt. Now, I understand. 
I don't want to be critical because I'm in this with you. I'm a Hebrew as well. And I feel the pain. I feel the hurt. Every time I learn something that happened to our people, I feel it. I feel the frustration. I feel the anger. I feel it. And I know you feel it too. But at the end of the day, the Father does not want us to allow hatred and bitterness and animus to prevent us from our mission. Let us not let anything or anyone prevent us from being a light into the Gentiles like the Most High intended. There are people who don't know what to do. They don't know their right hand from their left, and they need someone to teach them. That's our role. We've got to step up, and we've got to allow the Most High's grace, which is sufficient for us to heal us of all the hurt and all the pain so that we can step into our rightful place as royalty, as kings and priests and teachers and judges and leaders and light and salt. That is what we're called to. So I pray that this message lands well in your hearing and in your heart. This is something that the most I laid on my heart and wanted me to share it. And I'm sharing it. I'm just being obedient. And I'm speaking to myself first. I've got to make sure that I am doing what is pleasing in the most high sight as well. This is a message to all of us, not just some of us, all of us. So may we allow the most high to heal us. May we take our rightful place within the kingdom. It was prepared for us. Well, brothers and sisters, I want to thank you for joining me here on the Shabbat. I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank you for hearing. I want to thank you for allowing the Most High to take this message and imprint what he desires to be imprinted into your heart and that which is of me and not of him to just cast away. May every word that's spoken in the flesh and not of the Most High, may it fall on deaf ears. But those things that are spoken from the heart of the Father, may they be received and may they be acted upon. So let us recap very quickly. As we step into our authority in the earth, we have to realize that true power comes from being under authority. True power comes when we are able to submit to authority, when we are able to honor our authority, and when we are able to be humble before the Most High, before the world, and before the authority placed over us. And when we do that, brothers and sisters, we become so powerful, so powerful. And this is what the Most High is expecting of us. He will fight our battles for us. He will take care of our enemies. He will do it. Vengeance is his. He will repay, saith Yahuwah. He will take care of that. Our job is to humble ourselves before him and trust him to take care of us. We don't have to be angry at the wicked. The Most High is already angry at the wicked every day. What we need to do is seek his face and he'll do the rest. So as you rest on this day of rest and as you spend time in the Father's presence, ask him, seek his face regarding things that you may have said or done to those who are in authority over you, whether it be a boss or a husband or a more or mora or whatever, whatever the case may be. It could be the Father himself. Get in his presence and allow him to show you those things that you may have done, those ways in which you may have been inappropriate regarding your respect for leadership and ask him to forgive you. And if need be, if you need to repent to that person, ask the Father to guide you in that. And also, with regard to the Gentiles, ask the Father to show you your own heart and ask him, as I will be today, ask him to heal you. Ask him to heal us of the pain so that we can be free to receive those ones that he is granting salvation to and understand that the rest he will judge. May the Most High Baruch can keep you, brothers and sisters. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you shalom, shalom, peace. And may everything that the Father has for us be ours as we submit, honor, and humble ourselves under his mighty hand. May we respect the authority that he has given us. And may we not place our mouths or our hands on the Most High's anointed. And may we do his prophets no harm. 
Shabbat Shalom, brothers and sisters. Shabbat Shalom. Mm-hmm.